A new award-winning documentary directed by Jennifer Holness tackles the often dangerous portrayals of black women in media and the shift in North American beauty standards towards embracing black female aesthetics. Jennifer sat down with me to discuss the film and how we can improve representation in our media. Hi, my name is Jen Holness. I'm a writer, producer, and director, and I directed the film Subjects of Desire. Um, I actually have uh, my own production company, Hungry Eyes Media, and I've been sort of making film and television for the last, I don't know, 20 years. <laughs> so what first got you like on that bug for making media and documentaries? So you know what it is, is that so, um, when I grew up, there was three of us and we were not, we didn't have a lot of money. I didn't really understand how to make films or any way to get into the industry and so forth. I met my partner at York University and he was in film studies. And, and that was what kind of opened up the idea that I could work in film and television. But when I first started out, um, I was... Um, I graduated from York University with a specialized honors in policy analysis and political science, a fancy political science degree. And I decided that I wasn't going to go into politics or go become a lawyer, any of those kinds of things. And I just decided I was going to try film. And that was that was the thing. But what the backstory, though, was that growing up, I, I would write at home. I would and I was a completely avid read, reader. And I, you know, the. I didn't actually have those connections or see those connections. But then I read, for example, Stephen King on writing. The fact that I was writing as a kid and that I was reading as a kid, that there was a natural in me around telling story. So when I graduated, I decided to move and pursue that. And then I started out producing primarily. In my producing, I was always story editing. I was always writing stuff. And then I realized that I, I you know, that I wanted to write, which is what I had been doing from a kid. And, and then I decided that, and I started doing that. And it helped that I had actually taught myself how to produce so that I was able to do the, the writing and the producing. And then on the documentary side, my very first professional project, I co-directed a documentary about Black Canadian history. And I was really, really jazzed about that project. And we did it with the National Film Board and it really turned out well. And I wanted to direct more uh, documentaries, but you know, I had three kids, um, I was writing drama, I was, um, you know, producing drama and, and I was also producing other people's documentaries because I always loved documentaries, always kept a foot in it. So even though I wasn't directing, I was producing other people's mm -hmm. docs. And then I guess uh, in 2017, um, I made a decision that, you know, my kids were older. I really had sort of probably not pursued this element of filmmaking, you know, directing documentaries that I really loved and that I think I was, you know, good at. Um, I hadn't done that and, uh, and I decided it was time. And so that is how I ended up, like after making my first documentary in 2000, um, uh, to make this other, my second documentary, but a feature this time, mm -hmm. it starting in 2017 and delivering it in 2021. <laughs> Isn't that just fun how like your path can like just lead you to a certain spot that you didn't initially expect to reach? Completely. My career, my entire career is like that because like I said, what I went to university for, I completely didn't do. But, you know, I think what it is, was being brave. You know, when I graduated, my mother, I was invited to actually uh, um, submit to law school. My grades were really good. I had like the, the program I pursued. Um, I could either go into business, um, like I could go for an, you know, an MBA or I could go for on the law side. Um, and I, I, I didn't want to do that. But uh, I think, you know, I was brave. I decided at a very young age, like, no, that's not what I want to do. I, and I don't know what this film thing is, but I, it feels right. I went with my gut. I went with my instinct. And then I'm a really hard worker. And so what I did was I just, I had to figure out 
what make producing films was about. I had to figure out how do you write for, so I, I, I did that, you know, we didn't have a lot of mentors. We didn't have a lot of people who um, could support us and uh, we didn't know anybody in the industry, um, but it was, that was not that important. What was important was how do I figure out how to do this work well so that I could make a living from it. So yeah, that mm -hmm. was, that was the assignment, I guess. <laughs> smaller production companies like they really turn at least in my opinion some of the most profound work or the, like work that really hits you close to home you're really invested in the communities and people like you know what's going on you yeah look you know i i i've always been very community minded and i do think that we have a problem in this country where we have we're really predominantly publicly funded and we don't support the voices of the, all the people that make up the public we haven't historically and that's been a problem and so being outside of the story engine of Canada, like in terms of my community and any focus on our stories, um, has really, it, it, it is a painful thing. I mean, people, everybody, every group wants to be seen and heard. We want to believe and know that we count. And being a part of the media world, it, that's, that's it. You know, um, someone told me, and it's brilliant, it was Dr. Charmaine Nelson, she said, we know about slavery, most people, 99% of people know about slavery, predominantly because of the movies they've seen. Mm -hmm. Very few of us like randomly will go into a bookstore and say, hey man, I'm gonna leave, read this treatise on slavery, right? But yet we know a bunch of stuff about slavery it comes from movies, you know? And so that's the power of media. That's the power of story and cinema. And so imagine spending most of your life where so few people have been given the opportunity to tell stories about your community, you know, and when they have done it, it's been very narrow. So it's maybe just been about slavery. It's not been about the nuances of, you know, like what might you might go through if you look like this as a black girl, or if you, if you come from this household as a black boy, you know what I mean? And so, I have been always community minded because my community has always felt disenfranchised from the larger system of media and what we get to tell and who gets to tell it. So it's, so I think though, oftentimes that's where the beauty of the unknown comes, you know, you get like a story that takes you into a world or into a space that you thought you knew, and then you realize something incredibly pivotal or something personal. I mean, there's just a lot of story out there that, and there's an exciting times and um, where we're now starting to see the value. I mean, I didn't watch it, but all these folks watch Squid Game. I hate oh, it's when people mm -hmm. get murdered. You know, I hate murdering shows. I just... <laughs> upsetting to me you know I, I read the hunger games because my kids were reading it but i couldn't watch the movies because i just was so traumatized from the books um i don't like that extreme violence but like with squid game for example everybody watched this show and you know and guess what that's because someone recognized story out like out of that community out of those creators was valuable to the larger and it, and it engaged people right Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we have to do. We have to expand um, our story world. And that comes out of community. Representation in media is so powerful. Like uh, Encanto that recently came out has been amazing for the, uh, the, the, the Latin communities. Like just being able to see those stories, see people who look like you and you can relate to like, for individuals like myself, we've had people in media who, who look like me for so long. So it's great to see this, I guess it's a, a cultural renaissance mm -hmm. uh, in a sense. Subjects of Desire, what can you tell me about your film? So Subjects of Desire is about black women and beauty, but it, it actually looks at the fact that beauty is about power, like, um, and that, if black women were not considered the standard, like the standard of what is considered beautiful, 
and beauty is power that is meant what does that look like for black women it's also about the fact that they have been very dangerous destructive narratives that came out of slavery and colonialization with an agenda, these narratives, and that these narratives have now become so interwoven with how we see Black women and how we see Black culture, we don't even question them, but they're dangerous and they're destructive, and they create a mindset in Black women and girls where they don't love themselves, where they have challenges embracing themselves, and also it actually gives power to to people over them. So for example, just on a legal scale, it looks at the fact that um, black hair, something that has really defined us as very different from whiteness has been used to punish and ostracize black women. You know, we have that, that moment where we talk about Bo Derek and that when, the, when a judge ruled that you could discriminate against a black woman, for her hair that a black woman had to conform to what the what the office required that she could not have her own natural style the judge literally said and this is a legal precedent that look at bo derrick she had braids in the movie 10 and she took her braids out so hair is mutable why is this black woman trying to be like Bo Derek and have braids. Never mind that Black women for centuries have had braids, that Bo Derek and the producers were mimicking Black women, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. But that is used to actually cement in law the ability that if I go to the workplace with my hair in cornrows, my boss could say, you can change your hair because our policy is that we have to have this kind of hair. So this is the kind of stuff that's been happening to Black women. And then people turn around and say, well, why are Black women straightening their hair with chemicals? That's dangerous. They must be crazy. They must want to look white versus the fact that society has actually made it almost impossible up until a certain point for Black women to walk around in the hair that God gave them. Yeah, so, talking about the, uh, yeah. the, the the hair, it reminded me a few years ago, like when you'd go Google search like professional hairstyles, you it would only be like white people yeah. and their hair. Um, I just quickly did a Google search now. I mean, it's still overwhelmingly uh, non-representative of, you know, people in the workforce, Maybe. but you know, there are a few in there now it's changing. it's changing but i gotta tell you when i was 15 years old i put braids in my hair went to work at shoppers drug mart because i had a good job i thought and my boss told me that my hair was rude and sent me home told me i had to change my hair if i wanted to work there so these are the things i mean think about it how debilitating something mm -hmm. like that is you know it's like especially since for me in not having straight hair, always wanting to have straight hair. And then I put braids in. So I had long like braids and I was like, look, I'm so, look at them flat, <laughs> so good. And then I go to work and then it's like, no, your hair is rude and you have to change it or you don't have a job. I mean, so, so, but then the other stereotypes, the Mammy, the Jezebel, the Sapphire, I mean, those stereotypes limit our movement into the world, you know, um, I, I pointed out that, you know, Billie Eilish is phenomenally successful. Um, Lana Del Rey, um, Adele, Taylor Swift, none of these women who are terrifically successful have had to present a sexualized image where their legs are open and their butts high, but almost every single black female star in the music industry right now is completely sexualized. Mm -hmm. I can't name a, a star, a big star that is black that isn't overly sexualized, right? You got Megan, you got um, um, like Beyonce, um, you have, um, you know, sorry, well, Doja, Doja Cat. I mean, Nicki Minaj, um, you know, the biggest, uh, sorry, the, the Latina and black one, um, um, 
you know, uh, sorry, she was a, she was a stripper. Um, and she did the the video WAP with um with Megan the Stallion. I mean, Cardi B. Car- Cardi- that's it. I was just yeah. thinking. I was like, I can't. Just- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are phenomenally successful women, incredibly sexualized. With your film, how, how did you approach this subject? What I discovered when I was doing research, I wanted to do a comprehensive look at this because I felt that we had to understand historically where these narratives came from. So I felt that was very important. I felt like I couldn't just do a film and say, oh, you know, Black women are discriminated about by their hair. I had to look at the source of things, right? So that comprehensive look, for example, showed us that, um, well, uh, Black women and their hair was considered ugly. And then um, Madam C.J. Walker came along and she came up with a, a methodology to press or straighten black hair. And then straightened hair was progress. Straightened hair was professional. So that is out of history, right? But then mm-hmm. why were, was black hair considered ugly? Well, during slavery and colon, colonial colonialization, well, there was a narrative of the mammy fat, older. She had her hair wrapped up because it was untenable in some way, right? And that Mammy was a caregiver. And that narrative of Black women caregiver. I want to really go back and say, where did this stuff come from? Mm -hmm. And you look, most of the movies that have been made up until recently about Black women have been about, you know, essentially Mammies, about maids, Mm -hmm. you know, women who, Black women who are maids. That's it. And then, you know, the same thing with the sexualization. So I wanted to go back and look at all of those things first. So that's what I started at. But I also wanted to look at present day. So how did these things manifest themselves today? What does that look like? What does Mammy, Jezebel, and Sapphire look like today? You know, and, you know, it looks like the snip, snap, angry black woman. Oh my gosh, she's crazy. You know, it looks like the very sexualized black woman. And, you know, and, and, and other than that, it looks like that black woman who's fat and unattractive. And she's just there though, to complain, but also serve. So look in media up until recently, like all the roles literally filtered through those kinds of narratives. If you go back far enough, all of this is tied to like white supremacy and, and oppression. And it's just, it's sad seeing that it is so present still to the modern day, like 400 years uh, in, in the United States. Like, ugh. there's people invested in, ma- in actually maintaining that. I mean, we've seen what's happened you know, in the political landscape in America to some extent where people are like, let's take out um, the knowledge or the information about some of these structures and call they call it critical race theory. Let's take it out. Let's not teach anybody this stuff. And let's just teach them like, you know, the, like the worst. The whitewashed and, version. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and people are invested in doing this today. That's what's sad. That is what's sad. And, and so my film hopefully... It will be, will be a counterpoint to to some of this, you know. So, how do we continue to to move forward and, and dismantle some of these harmful and dangerous stereotypes? I think it's allyship. It's it's actually it's allyship, you know. For one thing, I mean, I hope my film really contextualizes things so that people who aren't because these things are so ingrained, people don't really think about it. Like, you know what I mean? Because for example, for years, black folks were saying the criminal justice system targeted us and the dominant culture was saying, oh, that's because you're at the wrong place at the wrong time. Or what were you wearing, (laughs) you know? Or, you know, or what did you say to that officer? And then these cell phone reveals started to show us that no, (laughs) you know, they weren't at the wrong place at the wrong time. They were just jogging down the road, you know? And and so I think that my film in some ways um, is, is a little bit like that in that it actually shows us some of these narratives. And it's then for folks to say, I understand this better about Black women. 
I understand like these narrow confines in which they're being defined. I understand how my behavior, like when I don't believe a black woman, when I don't stand up for a black woman, when I when a sister is doing this and she's doing the most, but maybe it's it's like I'm I might be the one that's threatened because she's like doing this thing and I'm like I'm not doing this thing. So it's really about understanding first and foremost, and then saying, I'm going to stand up for you. I'm going to be there in your corner, or I'm just going to sit down and have a conversation with you. And that conversation is not going to be about what that sister can do for you, but how, who are you? What floats your boat? You know, what's going on in your world? And I, because I, you know, I think ultimately I'm a filmmaker because I'm inherently a hopeful person. I truly believe that in spite of some of the things I'm seeing unfolding over the last four or five years, I truly believe that our progress is possible when it comes to um, race and when it comes to structural and systemic um, (laughs) racism. I truly believe that um, we can really work and solve this. I mean, you know, I, I I don't know if you've seen this, but like Saturday Night Live does this thing with Tom Hanks where um, he plays like a like a country bumpkin and there's other black like country bump like black folks. Mm-hmm. And then the whole thing shows us how much like white country bumpkins and black folks are completely similar. Like they like the same food. They're like, you know, they, you know, like oh, there's a whole host of things that they, they really do have a lot more connections than not. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm, so I don't know. I'm always hopeful that, um, that, that these, this getting together is communicating will actually expose and 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 allow people to explore that they have more similarities than they have differences. Well, exactly. When you just meet people and get to know them, like, of course, there's like cultural differences. Like uh, when I first started dating my partner, uh, learning about like Filipino culture, Filipino foods, or like when I would um, use certain terms, like my the funniest story is when I, oh, I was going around trying to do a new story back uh, when I was uh, living in Winkler. I just couldn't find anything. I was driving around all these communities. And I just uh, told her, I was like, oh, uh, it took me on a wild goose chase today. She's like, why are you chasing geese? <laughs> okay, yeah. And that's just, it's, it's just yeah. a, such a cute thing. And so there's things like that that I've shared, like things that I thought were just common knowledge and just ingrained, but just those different cultural aspects. But like just because there's differences doesn't mean that's – that's a bad thing. Like you can learn from each other. It's a pivotal thing. I think it's to learn from each other. I mean, there are, there must be a whole plethora of things about her culture that you don't know about how those communities form and what is valuable to those communities as a, you know, as a Filipino woman. Um, And it's about um, you know, the problem of patriarchy, it's always perceived that the knowledge flowed from one way. And, and the thing is that it actually doesn't. And so when you start embracing these differences, you know, um, and when you start embracing that there might be certain knowledge, I mean, I always look to my mom who has all this, like, um, like this country remedies, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And she's always like, okay, you got to go with, you got to gargle your throat. You got to take this, you got to take ginger and this, and you got to make this. And, you, and so there's always this stuff. My mom's always telling me you got to do, and it's very different from North American society that, you know, they, they, there is a real, um, uh, like the first line for her is always something natural from the ground or whatever. And, you know, and I, I've, I've come to understand it because I mean, we might be of the same flesh and so forth, but I was raised in Canada and I have a very North American idea about medicine and so forth. But then at some point I start to realize, wait a minute, you know, my mom, what she was, what she was taught from her grandmother, whose grandmother taught her, some of that stuff is super valuable. And that's that, that and that's the um embracing of you know things that are different because people assume that because I was raised by a Caribbean woman 
that like I didn't want mac and cheese um like when I was growing up I didn't want like the the baked mac and cheese that was like a, a like a you know I, I wanted craft mac and cheese oh, right, craft. <laughs> <laughs> right? The, the college kids food <laughs> Oh, listen, I was like, I was like, this is ambrosia. What? You know, um, now, of course, I'm like, give me the baked mac and cheese because it's like gourmet. Um, but the point is, is that um, we, this this dominant culture, um, you know, patriarchy, white supremacy, all of these things, it has to be dismantled and, and the voices of others have to be uh, brought into that space. And so that we're actually sharing and learning from each other and communicating. And I think for me, my film is about communicating something, important things, uh, some great important things about Black women. What do you think we can do to keep our media and society accountable for, you know, moving towards progress and, you know, acceptance and representation? You have to challenge them. You have to say, you know, I, I did an article with the, the Globe interview, interviewed me, um, Sarah Ty Black, who's just a, a really wonderful journalist. And she asked me and I said, you know, we have to hold, we have to have gatekeepers and we have to hold the gatekeepers accountable and um you know so what that means is that we have to challenge it so uh, rather than saying oh i have my film and it's doing really great or whatever and I'm, i've arrived i i know i'm saying i'm i'm actually putting it out there that we have to hold these people the decision makers accountable so what we have to do is that sometimes it might not be in our full interest to actually hold people accountable, but we must do this. You know, it's like my children hold me accountable. They say, mom, dad, you've ruined this planet for us. The environment sucks. We can't, we can't maybe get homes, you know, we don't, you know, they're, they're, they're worried, you know, and my children are holding me accountable. And so what that means is that when, you know, two of them, one of them became a vegetarian and one of them became vegan, we embraced that. And we then uh, like shifted our eating uh, habits, which by the way, for being Caribbean, it's like, they're like, are you crazy? Um, so that's me being accountable as much as I can. So we have to hold, because for example, my children hold me accountable. And so we must say to the institution, also we have to look at what was promised, what are people saying that they intend to do? And if they're not doing it, we got to go back to them and say, hey, man, you said this. I, you know, we're, we're not seeing this. You know, we also have to, to be honest, we have to actually stop this madness where people think that there is no truth. And what I mean is like, it's this truth, it's that truth. No, no, no. Some things are true. And, we, and for those things, we can't stop explaining away and, you know, like, um, there's too much acceptance of falsehood. And when we come across it, we have to say, this is what's happening. We have to stand up for what is right. We have to stand up for each other and we have to stand up for, you know, uh, the, you know, what is a true thing? Is there a systemic problem with Black men when it, in the criminal just, justice system? Absolutely. Do they get um, different sentences for the same crime? Absolutely. You know, are they profiled at a higher level? Absolutely. These are truths. And so what are we willing to do to make that not be the case, right? And, and that's what I'm trying to say is that, so we have to really hold our gatekeepers um, uh, responsible for what they say that they're gonna do. And we have to also stand up when we see a truth being dismantled or broken, or, or we're creating some alternative version of reality to justify injustice. We got to stand together on, on these things because the way things are going, you can't, we can't just let things continue. Like the status quo is just not acceptable. Like if like being a progressive, it's all about moving forward towards the, the betterment of everyone. And I mean, and I mean, 
subjects of desire it's it's a first step in kind of uh, bringing awareness to uh you know the problems that we're seeing within our uh, our media and, and society and now people can see it and they can be inspired to work together towards greater things that's my hope that is my that's definitely one of my goals and hopes you know i want you know young black girls for example to watch this film and understand that they're not at fault that they the the things that they're feeling are actually true and they come from a certain place i want young white girls to say okay, this is my friend and this is how I can be a better friend because now I understand certain things about, you know, what's happening here, you know, pretending that these things don't exist or whatever. I, you know, I, I want those things to be, you know, to fall away. And so, yes, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. And I know that in the, in the screenings that I've had and, you know, I, the conversations people have brought to me about the film, I do think that it's actually having some great impacts in this way. And that, I mean, as a filmmaker, to have impact, to know that people are watching your work and, and seeing value and actually getting something from it that they can bring to their lives, I think it's, it's very powerful to me. And I, I feel very, very grateful for that. Well, Jen, it's been so great talking with you. I've had a lot of fun uh, learning about your life and just, you know, discussing like the real things in reality that we need to be focusing on and challenging. Where can people go to find out more about uh, Hungry Eyes Media and Subjects of Desire? Ah, okay. Geez, I'm so bad with this. Okay, so Subjects of Desire is going to be on TVO on Feb 1st. And um, I believe um, it, there's a couple of repeat dates um, in the U.S. It's going to be at, on Stars on Feb 26. Um, Hungry Eyes Media, we are hungryeyes.ca. Uh, um, and um, I'm sure Selena will send you like um, stuff for you to put up for our like Instagram and all the other stuff because um, I'm not remembering all that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. And I'm excited. Uh, the trailer was so good. I, I'm really excited. I, I just projects like this, like challenging your, your own thoughts. Like grow, I, I grew up in Winkler, like a small rural town and mm. just getting out of there, like, I realized like, wow, I had a lot of ingrained biases that I, I never realized. And, you know, getting challenged on those and, you know, see just interacting with people has been like the best. I think people just have to get out of their spaces. You know, this is one of the, uh, the challenges of COVID, of course, is that it's keeping us really insular. And I know that like my mom was like a single mom raising three kids. And so we didn't have a lot of money. And when I was old enough, I we started like I think when I was 15, we went to Montreal on our own, my sister and I. And then we went to New York and then we were like in Miami. And 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 then when I got older, I was able to travel, travel to Europe and traveling and of course going back to Jamaica but traveling in these spaces talking to people finding out about how people live it really shrinks a lot of the misunderstandings and so it's great that you know you speak of your own journey and like and acknowledging that there were these biases because they are because that society mm -hmm. puts them into you kids are not born you know this they're not mm -hmm. born you know, like uh, biased against someone. Society does this. So, but I do think stepping out of your comfort zone, reaching out to someone across the aisle, sometimes it's actually scary and sometimes it might not work out, but that, you know, I mean, I reached out to black people who have not been necessarily welcoming to me, uh, but I've also reached out to black people who have been incredibly welcoming and who have made my life a better place to be in, to be in this space. So, you know, that's the thing I just keep saying to people, you just got to push yourself to get out of your comfort zone. Enjoying the content from You Multicultural? Why don't you subscribe to stay up to date with everything that we're doing? If you have any stories you want us to talk about or communities we should highlight, leave a comment down below or reach out to us over social media. I'm Ryan Funk. This was You Talk. And have yourself a good one.